Welcome back to DEC Does What. I'm your host, Sean Mahar. Pronouns he, him, along with... Erica Ringwald, she, her. And Erica, today, well, we've been spending a lot of time on this show talking about the natural resources work that DEC does. We've spent some time learning about fish hatcheries. We've spent some time learning about the eclipse and wildlife. Uh, But one of the big things that DEC does here is actual environmental remediation. And, you know, people hear that term, environmental remediation. I don't think they fully know and appreciate everything that goes into what we do to clean up the environment. And New York being a heavily industrialized state here, we have a very uh, unfortunate legacy of contamination and pollution that we have many amazing experts around the state who are here helping day in and day out to clean that stuff up and get it out in the environment. So we're excited today to uh, spend some time with two of our remediation experts here at the department, and we'll introduce them in a second. But Erica, I think listeners would want to know why we are so interested in environmental remediation and how we came to be so passionate about DER, as it's called. Why don't you tell our listeners what we do weekly with our DER colleagues? So every week, we bring the band back together. Uh, I believe it's Thursday afternoons, and we go through the fact sheets, and we talk about significant milestones for various cleanups across the state. That includes through the state Superfund program, uh, as well as the Brownfield Cleanup Program. Um, And it includes sites in Buffalo, upstate. It includes sites uh, in the New York City area, particularly Gowanus in Brooklyn uh, and Long Island. All over. And these are, well, they have come to be one of my favorite meetings of the week because I get to learn about everything that's going on around the state. And now my family loves me all the time because whenever we're driving anywhere, I say, hey, did you know that's a You did that with me on the train down in New York City last week. We have so many amazing projects that we have underway. But one of the reasons why I want to focus on um, our environmental remediation program today is there's been a lot of news on Long Island about our uh, cleanup of the Grumman plume. And the U.S. Navy and Northrop Grumman uh, have a major uh, cleanup effort underway in the Bethpage community. And today we're here with Jessica LeClaire and Jason Pelton, two of our uh, remediation engineers and experts here who are working on that site. And this summer, we've uh, obviously had this in the news a bunch. Uh, We found some hidden underground drums that uh, we didn't expect to find there. And that really uh, highlighted the importance of, you know, what DEC is doing to really keep New Yorkers in this community protected. So Jason, Jess, we're really glad to have you on the show today. And I think we were just start off a little bit about, you know, the Grumman plume and the cleanup that goes underway. So Jason, I know you've been spending a lot of time down on Long Island this summer and and throughout your career on this project. But what are we doing in this area? And, you know, what is sort of, you know, the community should know about these efforts right now? Yeah, Sean, thanks for the nice introduction. And thanks for having us here today. Uh, there really is a tremendous amount occurring on Long Island to address the Navy Grumman groundwater plume, and I think we really want to make sure that the communities are aware of that. Uh, and it's a two-prong approach. It's addressing the very large, the massive Navy Grumman groundwater plume. Uh, it's it's about four miles long, two miles wide, and extends to depths of about 900 feet. So both Navy and Northrop Grumman have a lot of work that's already been completed. That's the remediation systems operating to address this plume, and they have more coming up in the very near future. Uh, and then the other piece to this is clean up a Bethpage Park. Uh, that's solely Northrop Grumman's responsibility. Uh, they've completed a lot of work uh, already there, uh, and, and some of that was really important to complete early on to prevent uh, the contaminants from moving off-site and to prevent any exposures to the contamination. With that completed, they still have a few more steps to, to uh, complete, and, and we're going to get to that in over the next couple of years. Uh, but certainly you pointed out the, uh, the discovery of some drums uh, by Northrop Grumman. Uh, there were uh, concrete-encased drums uh, beneath what's called the former baseball field. Uh, they were identified when Northrop Grumman was uh, constructing uh, what we call a thermal remedy. Um, they were drilling and uh, hit, hit concrete. And it wasn't until they started to excavate um, that concrete that they found these concrete encased drums. Um, and uh, since then, since they were discovered in late March, they've they've been removed uh, and disposed of properly offsite. 
So is that typically something we find at remediation sites? Like, are we uncovering things like that that we didn't know about or things that former companies had buried underground? It is. It, 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 it was a surprise to find drums, 55-gallon drums, encased in concrete. That was a surprise. Uh, but the fact that we found drums isn't surprising. I mean, this is where Northrop Grumman disposed of a lot of their waste. So to find drums there isn't a major surprise. And, and I've worked at dozens of remediation sites across New York State from Long Island to Buffalo. And uh, when you start uncovering the ground, you start digging into the ground, you find things from underground piping, underground storage tanks, cesspools, dry wells, um, and, and, and drums in, in various states. Uh, they can be fully intact drums with, with material inside of them, or they could be you know, crushed drums, just remnants of, of uh, former 55-gallon drums. So, Jason, you mentioned the, we're using the, a thermal remedy on this site. Could you unpack that a little bit. What does that mean exactly? How does that work? And what can people expect to see? Yeah, so a thermal remedy. Uh, it's a technique that we use. It's, it's fairly specialized. You just got to have the right conditions, the right contaminants. But it's basically uh, in installing a series of uh, uh, heating wells into the ground. In this case, they're about 35 to 50 feet beneath the ground surface. Uh, it's a network of over 350 of these heating wells, uh, and, and they're sp spaced closely together uh, and uh, designed specifically to heat the soil to uh, about 100 degrees Celsius. So that's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So it really heats up the soil to a high temperature, and that basically uh, desiccates the soil, dries it up, uh, allows the contaminants that we know are in that soil to be liberated, to be freed, so that they can be removed from the soil, captured by uh, you know, specific wells uh, to, to remove those contaminants from the soil and, uh, and treat them at the surface so that they're no longer there. So we're cleaning up the soil using this thermal, this heating technique. What are some of the contaminants that we're finding there? What are, what are the contaminants that are common to this site? The key contaminant associated with the former Navy and Northrop Grumman operations are the, the, the classic uh, chlorinated solvents. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's trichloroethene, TCE. So, Jason, four miles long, two miles wide, 900 feet deep, if I got that right. You're right on. Plume underground. Above ground, you just see parking lots, infrastructure, how homes, communities, like, and all this is taking place underground. How are we, like, how do we go in and evaluate something like this to even understand its magnitude and design these cleanup plans? Like, walk us through some of those steps that you take. Yeah, it's a, you know, you look at the plume on a, on a piece of paper, it's, it's one thing, but it's a three-dimensional issue. It really is when you're talking about those depths. I mean, most of our sites across the state are probably under 100 feet where we've got contamination. In this case, we're, we're really deep. Uh, but one of the first things we need to do to, to really design a remedy that we're confident is going to meet our objectives and is going to clean up this contamination is to fully define the nature and extent of that contamination. And to do that, you know, we work with uh, the Navy and Northrop Grumman to, to what we drill what we call vertical profile borings. Um, 900,000 feet deep into the ground. Uh, we collect soil samples, groundwater samples as, as we drill. Uh, and we send those samples to the laboratory for analysis. And, uh, you know, based on those results, we install monitoring wells. And, and to this point, Navy and Northrop Grumman have installed hundreds uh, of these vertical profile borings, installed hundreds of monitoring wells to really, to get our arms around this, this, this massive plume and, and enable us to figure out, okay, this is where we need to it's really important for us to install an extraction well at this location uh, to remove high concentrations of the contamination and to install wells along the leading edge of the plume uh, that to serve that purpose of hydraulically containing the plume, to intercepting it so that it doesn't continue to migrate to the south and, and impact you know, some of those currently unimpacted public water supply wells that are south of the plume. 
So this clearly takes a lot of science and engineering and, and really understanding of uh, the below ground chemistry of what you're dealing with. And it's fascinating to hear, you know, some of what you're talking about. And that's why, you know, with the fact sheet meetings, I've learned something every week and new that, you know, the, the approaches that we take and how we do this. And obviously, Jason, it's not all on you and you have a big team that's working on this. And Jess, we're glad you're here with us as well. You know, what's some of your role on this project and, and what do you bring to the team when, when you work with Jason on this? I'm relatively new to the site. I just got involved pretty much right when the drums uh, were discovered. So um, with the drum drum work, we uh, I was working with the, the removal and you know trying to explain to the community what was happening um, and keeping everybody up to date as much as possible. Yeah, that community engagement is really critical to all our remediation work, right? Because obviously we're talking about environmental contamination and public exposure to these contaminants. And that's something we have to take a lot of pride in because our goal here is to protect public health and the environment. Could one of you sort of um, explain the different sorts of cleanup programs that we oversee here at DEC? I know that we have a role in everything from transformation of the former massive uh, Tonawanda Coke site out in western New York to, like, the corner dry cleaner, if if you could sort of explain the difference between a brownfield cleanup and a Superfund site. The Division of Environmental Remediation, I would say the bulk of our work is in two programs. Um, the, the brownfield cleanup program, which is uh, geared at you know, trying to uh, revitalize communities, uh, taking these abandoned underutilized vacant properties and getting them redeveloped. Uh, the, they're underutilized, they're, they're vacant because there's fear of contamination or there's known contamination. So the Brownfield program uh, provides developers an opportunity to uh, you know, re- redevelop those, those sites. Um, and then the other big piece is our state super fund program. And this is uh, you know, where we use state funds uh, to to investigate and and clean up sites. These are are uh, commonly uh, in need of cleanup investigation because there's no viable party. Uh, there, we know that they they represent a significant threat to human health and the environment. We just don't have a, a party that's able to to complete that investigation and cleanup work. So we use our state super funds for that. So these are two of the tools that are in the state's toolbox that are really driving a lot of this work. And, you know, it's, again, fascinating to to really see and think about it. It's a lot of history in the state that we're uncovering and, and cleaning up and, you know, really working to create sites that are marketable for the future from a development standpoint. We want these areas to be put back into productive use, really take the pressure off green space development and, and focus it where we are. So when you come to work every day, I mean, what motivates you and drives you to want to work on these sites? Because this is really complex stuff. Obviously, it's interesting, but, you know, it's got to be a little difficult, I assume. But really, what what keeps you going at, at these shops? This is what I've been doing my whole life. Uh, definitely, have, you know, from my college days, I've always had a passion for groundwater. Um, and then you get to combine that with uh, the chemistry piece, the, the contamination piece. Uh, it makes it even more interesting, exciting. But uh, you know, I, I think the big driver is, you know, seeing uh, the transformation, is, is knowing that you're, you're uh, working towards cleaning up the environment, cleaning up a site, and, and, and moving it towards uh, uh, a position so that it can be used again, redeveloped, and, 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 and purposeful. So, Jess, what about you? Uh, as I say, well, I started off with chemical engineering when I went to school, but I also did some environmental policy. Um, and before getting into this new section, um, a lot of the sites I worked on were former IBM sites. Um, so it was definitely being able to watch the sites transition um, to being reused again and bringing new uh, manufacturing in, as well as cleaning up some other large groundwater contamination. Um, where did you go to school? And like, what was your career pathway into DEC? Um, I went to RPI for chemical engineering, and then I got a master's in environmental policy. Um, and one of the ladies that was in my class in environmental policy worked at DEC, and the civil service test was being given for the engineers. So uh, I took that, and then that kind of started me on my path here. That's awesome. And Jason, did you have a similar path? 
a little or what bit. brought you to DC? Uh, I started off actually going to Paul Smith College, so right in the heart of the Adirondacks, you know, an environmental program, and then uh, transferred to a state school, SUNY Oneana, where I pursued hydrogeology and just developed a real passion for that and uh, got my master's at RPI locally here in, in hydro, hydrogeology. A lot of what we've talked about today so far has been legacy contamination. And now I know, uh, you know, on New Yorkers' minds is this term, emerging contaminants, and we're entering now the uh, PFAS era. How does, you know, perfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS, you know, how has that changed our approach to these sites? Have we had to adapt at all, or is it really the tried and true methods still play out for these different compounds and our approaches are the same? That's a great question, Sean. Um, and, and we're learning a lot uh, it's an evolving field for sure. Um, fortunately, we've got some great staff that this is what they focus on is are the emerging contaminants. Um, I mean, that's how important it is to, to our division, to the state, is is managing these emerging contaminants. So we've got a section devoted to, to this topic. Uh, but uh, it, it's a combination. It's it's new technologies, you know, for 1,4-dioxane, um, the emerging contaminant 1,4-dioxane. Doesn't doesn't respond well to some of the traditional remediation cleanup techniques like air stripping, uh, granulated activated carbon. We have to use a technique that's called a, a advanced oxidation process or AOP. Uh, for some of the the perfluorinated compounds, uh, we can use traditional techniques um, uh, like like granulated activated carbon, but it, it's it's still a challenge, and 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 um, we're finding it in a lot of uh, you know groundwater across the state at really low concentrations. Um, so we're gonna, we have to go back and, and, and revisit some of the sites that we've looked at. So Jess, when you're out at these sites, now are you like getting in the backhoes or the drill rigs? Are you collecting your own samples? Are you overseeing DEC staff or contractors to do um, this work? A lot of it is overseeing uh, contractors and staff. Um, we are not usually in the backhoes. Um, well, that's boring. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is. Um, so my we, boy we would dream to be out the, with you guys and get to use this stuff. <laughs> we do collect our own samples, um, okay, you know, on several of our sites. But, yeah, we don't actually get to use the heavy equipment. <laughs> How is it working with the construction industry? And, like, do are they really receptive and, like, easy to work with? Do, are there difficulties because they're hired by the responsible parties? And do you ever, like, have any tension in the field at all? Uh, the, the sites I've worked on, everything's been pretty cooperative. Um, you know, the... The people running the drill rigs, they usually tend to go, you know, we see something, we want a closer look at it, they'll stop what they're doing so we can get a better look at, um, you know, what boring they're pulling out. Or... So they're good to work with. Yeah, certainly on Long Island, uh, you know, both Navy and, and Northrop Grumman uh, have realized it's it's a challenging environment. It's pretty much fully developed, fully built out in Nassau County. So. When you have to drill a, a deep vertical profile boring, you're there for two months, and they've figured out good, good using good techniques to try to minimize the impacts on the community. And same thing with the construction companies that are installing the the conveyance piping for uh, transporting the contaminated water from the extraction well to the treatment plant. Uh, there's certain contractors that are familiar with working in those types of conditions. Uh, so. To, to try to minimize the impacts on the community, to, to be efficient with the pipe installation. They're, they're not only navigating very busy, congested roads, but a lot of underground utilities. So they've really got a few contractors that they've been able to work with that have done this work efficiently. One, so, of, one of the things that we've been working on over the past several years is um, sort of making the way that we are communicating out to folks where we're doing these cleanups uh, more robust. So we're doing that through uh, DEC Delivers. You can sign up for emails to learn about sites in and near your community. Um, we have our online mapping tool, the DEC Info Locator. And our website, dec.ny.gov, is a veritable treasure trove of information about the work that is ongoing through our cleanup programs. So I would encourage folks looking to learn more about the Brownfield Cleanup Program, Sites in the State, Superfund, as well as other cleanups underway, to check out the DEC website. Definitely, and I know, uh, Jason, I think we have some videos of you up there on our YouTube page and on the website. And, and obviously, each uh, remediation site does have its own dedicated page, information repository, so you can really find this information. But one of the things I like the most about it is 
all the project managers have their contact information on the fact sheets that go out. We have access. People can come to you and ask the questions that they have and, and really hear directly from the experts. And, uh, you know, we take great pride in that, and it's glad to uh, have you both on the front lines. Um, but, Jess, how can uh, people join our team and, and sort of, you know, how are we attracting the next generation of our uh, environmental remediation experts here in the state? Um, well, New York has started the HELPS program. Um, and that seems to be a easier way of getting people to apply to the state and have more job opportunities. Um, you know, they can apply as soon as you're at, coming out of college. Um, and there's a lot of great opportunities actually on that on that website. Um, that's really helped get us some new, new and fresh blood into the agency. Yeah, we actually just hired seven new engineers using awesome. the HELPS uh, program. So you got to get those welcome letters ready, Sean. Oh, I signed about 150 yesterday. Nice. So we've gotta... That is like the best thing I've heard all week. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's amazing. It's cool to see this team growing and, it's you know, to learn from experts like you who, I mean, Jess, you've been here 19 years, Jason, 20 years, you know, the, your legacies of the department have built these programs and stewarded these sites and really made some great progress happen. And we are glad you, you could join us on the show today. I do hope, Jess, that you didn't dissuade people from coming here knowing that they can't use backhoes and, you know, do more heavy duty field work. <laughs> the dream of heavy equipment. I know, my dream was crushed. But that, that would probably be one of the other divisions. There you go. All right. See, yes, the parks, there are many parks, opportunities. Areas, operations. Uh, operations. Yeah, trail maintenance. Trail yep. maintenance. And we'll have all them on DEC Does What Next. But <laughs> Jason, Jess, thanks for joining us today and talking to us about the uh, North of Crimea Plume and all the important work we have on Long Island, but really across the state. We're glad that you could join us and talk a little bit about our Superfund and Brownfield cleanup programs here, you know, two real pillars of the agency and our remediation work, and glad that you could share your expertise with us today. Great. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Well, Erica, it was great to uh, hear from our remediation experts today. We've got a whole team down there. That Impressive probably, crew. Probably have more of them on throughout the summer on your favorite Superfund sites around the state. Uh, please email us at contact at dec.ny.gov. Again, let us know what more you want to hear on this show. But when it comes to Superfund and Brownfields, if you have questions on them, please email us and we'll put you in touch with the experts or we'll cover it on the show in the future. But uh, Erica, I know there's a lot of other news uh, of the week uh, at DEC here. Um, you know, what's going on that we haven't talked about yet? So a lot of stuff happening. In the last couple of weeks, um, big milestone uh, achieved. Uh, governor in 2022, Governor Hochul set a goal of DEC and our colleagues at NYSERDA releasing an extreme heat action plan. This work over two years involved 25 New York State agencies and authorities working together to identify recommendations and strategies to help communities deal with the extreme heat that we are seeing more frequently because of our uh, changing climate. So it's really an impressive document. It's available on the DEC website. It includes 49 different actions and recommendations to help New Yorkers you know, adapt to and deal with extreme heat that can really impact uh, your health. Yeah, Erica, it's fascinating. I'm glad we got the extreme heat action plan out. Our team was really, uh, well, Leo in particular, Leo Bachinger. Leo Bachinger. And the uh, Office of Climate Change really, you know, led the multi-agency effort across the state to get this plan in place. A lot of good recommendations that now our uh, sleeves are rolled up and we got to work on. Um, but really, when it comes to extreme heat and fighting climate change, I know that uh, we've had some climate smart communities that we've announced recently. What's that all about? Yeah, so DEC uh, manages the Climate Smart Communities Program, which recognizes municipalities taking local action to fight climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So what I love about this program is built into it is that New York State can't meet these goals on our own. We all play a role in reducing emissions, and we recognize the communities who are doing great work at the local level, setting an example for communities statewide to follow. It's a great program, so we just added 23 new uh, Climate Smart communities to the program, recognize their efforts. And they're from across New York. Um, this program has been particularly popular in the Hudson Valley, but we've got s folks in the Finger Lakes, Western New York, Adirondacks, Long Island, runs the gamut. 
So definitely visit dec.ny.gov and our Climate Smart Communities page. You can find out how you can sign your community up if you're not already signed up. There are uh, different levels of participation, and we have a great team that's here to help communities through that process and really get them, uh, you know, helping to fight our climate change efforts across the state. As you said, it takes everyone here in the state. We're trying to really incentivize and inspire those local actions to occur. But speaking of local actions, uh, and it is uh, the summer season, and surprisingly enough, we let you out of the office recently. Recently, Erica. That's to, uh, right. I, was, I escaped and, my cubicle. Yeah, I went to uh, Zor Valley, I believe. So what's up in Zor Valley in Western New York? The- Zor Valley is a nearly 3,000 acre majestic and unique resource in Western New York. Um, it's also a, a wild and potentially dangerous place. And over the last few decades, a uh, few people have lost their lives at Soar Valley in a variety of accidents. Um, these are people with families, right, who uh, love them. And uh, former Commissioner Sagos and uh, a team of us here at DEC worked with these families to try and identify some really common sense public safety Uh, strategies that we could advance there to help make it safer for folks. Um, Part of that involved hundreds of new safety signs. It included uh, communicating with external parties to update their online maps so people were getting the right information about how to access the site and enter it so they can see the, um, the cliffs and the gorge, which are beautiful but also hazardous, right? So we undertook this really massive public safety effort. We also uh, built a new trail, and we're calling it the Memorial Trail, um, remembering the folks who lost their lives. And yesterday we had the opportunity to preview the trail for a couple of the families who were available um, and share everything that we've been doing to date and, and the work that lies ahead. But it was it was really a gratifying experience to hear directly from them that they are they're pleased with the work that we've done and you know just to to be able to to share that experience with them was was really unique and and really special and it reminds me of why I work here. That's great, Erica, and I'm glad you were out there. And you know, kudos to you for all the work that you hope lead the team on to really put that focus and attention that's needed on sites like this. And you know, obviously, hiking smart, hiking safe this summer. We've got a lot of tips on our social media pages, on our website. Please keep checking out dec.ny.gov. Uh, we've got a lot of information for you just to hike smart, hike safe, and really enjoy the outside and outdoors this summer. Uh, but please, again, keep em- emailing us at contact at dec.ny.gov. Let us know more about what you want to hear on the show. Um, But Erica, importantly, what should all listeners do? Get outside. DEC Does What? is a production of DEC's Division of Communication, Education, and Engagement. Our theme music is an original composition by Mike Menza, wildlife technician with DEC's Division of Fish and Wildlife. Like what you heard on this episode? Please leave a review and share this episode with others. Want to learn more about DEC's wide-ranging efforts to protect New Yorkers and the environment? visit dec.ny.gov or connect with us on social media. You can find us using at NYSDEC. For more information on DEC Does What, visit dec.ny.gov slash podcast.